With that, um, we're going to continue our conversation. We're going to bring up uh, Sandy Lamb, who has been working on the first and only comparative effectiveness study in LGS that I've ever heard of. And that is important because it's comparing two types of treatment head to head against each other. So it's going to be a great talk. Dr. Lamb, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to be here um, and really talk about research that is powered by you. This is um, a study that's in progress that is sponsored by the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And you'll, you'll see that our team is actually made up of surgeons, neurologists, informaticists, um, Tracy representing all of you, and, and you'll see elements of how we've actually powered the study um, from questions that are relevant to you, and actually that's what we're, we're trying to find out. So in PCORI, um, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, and those are the types of research studies that, that um, the funding agency is looking for. And this study is only as good as we make it together. So we, we've talked a lot this morning about clinical trials and designs and if you get to enroll and, and see what happens. But this is actually based on real world evidence and real world data and what's happening in the country now. And how do we come up with information that is usable to you? Not, not from studies from other countries or from other patient populations. So here we use a national data set uh, that is run by PCORI and PCORNET that studies patterns of care for people with the diagnosis of LGS and what is happening and what has happened. And then we work with families just like you to study outcomes that matter the most to you. So it may not be seizure counts or diaries, and we'll look at that. So the, the main question of this study is maybe many that you have faced um, here in this room. At some point, um, you will have this question. Do we add another medication or do we choose a surgery? How many in this room are at that point right now? Okay, I see some hands. How many have lived that? I see a lot of hands. So this is actually the first study that looks at this question head to head. We're in the middle of the study right now. So, so you'll see that we are, um, it, it's a multi-year study. And we're actually looking at medical records and, and, um, and data that's already in PCORNET. So this will, this will be a, a multi-part talk. I don't have our final results to, um, to share with you, but this is really to say like, where are we, how did we get here, and where are we in this study, what we've learned so far, and, um, and asking, asking for your input, and, and honestly, asking for some reality checks. As I told you that this study is only as good as we make it together. It doesn't matter what I think about the study design, right? So, so we'll talk about this. The diagnosis of LGS, as we've seen from multiple speakers, is made up of, of a, a triad, right? Mul multiple components. And, you know, it's very clear that when you look at a medical record, nobody says, aha, that's it, right? It's actually, you have to look at multiple elements and then over time as well. We know that seizures are very difficult to control in LGS. So actually based on a natural history survey that many of you participated in, uh, with Dr. Berg and Dr. Koh and, um, and Tracy, um, the, these are actually what you've reported, that the seizures are very difficult to control and that a majority of patients actually have more than two seizures a day and that in the previous half a year at the time of this natural history study, over a third have had emergencies and actually had to go to the ER and multiple um, uh, ER visits to boot. And rescue medications are actually pretty commonly used. And it's actually not just seizures, right? Beyond seizures, there's the cognitive impairment, the intellectual disability, and the autism features, and also um, impairments in functional abilities, like needing mobility help, um, feeding help, um, communication help. So then when you look at surgeries, 
we know that, um, or medicines, we know that when you look at seizure control, the earlier the seizure control, the greater the improvement in cognitive abilities, as well as a, a lot of other things that, that we can or can't measure, right? So here's just one study to show that. So this shows that um, before a surgery or after a surgery, and this is for a very specific subtype, which is just resective surgery. So when resective surgery isn't an option, we can see actually across the country that the most commonly uh, um, offered treatments or um, treatments that have been done uh, in, in recent years um, over the past decade has been VNS uh, or corpus callosotomy. And then we've heard a lot about how neuromodulation such as RNS or DBS are being more and more commonly offered and, uh, and, and used successfully. So when you look at all that's available in the literature right now. Uh, we did a meta-analysis and looked at all the statistics and all of the studies that were reported. When we just looked at this, this comparative effectiveness question of surgery or medications for LGS, if you look at all the blue together, those are uh, the medications, and, uh, and the green uh, are the, the common surgeries, you can see there's actually what we call equipoise. Right, the answer is not obvious there. So it, when we look at this, well, we would have a conversation and say, well, I don't know how that applies to your loved one, but really we should pick together because I don't have the one answer for you. That's what we're trying to find now, is that answer that is gonna be most helpful and applicable to you when you're faced with that question. So this is our team, actually Mark Rosenman, uh, who is a pediatrician and healthcare informaticist uh, and health services research sitting um, in the back of the room here. Uh, Anup Patel is not here. Um, he's uh, in another meeting uh, in Minnesota right now. Of course, Tracy. But other elements of, uh, of our team who are um, super important, like um, Mary uh, Wardranowski uh, is here. She's a neuropsychologist from Ohio. Uh, and our research coordinators, uh, Meg and, and medical students, Nicole, who you've all inspired uh, to go into a, a career in um, epilepsy or neurosurgery. We'll see. Um, and uh, they, they are at a table um, in, in, the, um, in the hall uh, if you want more information. So when we looked at this question, it seems like, well, you know, the next things I should show you are, well, we designed the study and these are the statistics and this is what happened, right? But here's how we break it down to the things that, that I showed you are the things that you are living now, right? The seizures, the comorbidities, the, the, the trips to the ER and the other issues. So we actually wanna measure multiple things to make this study relevant to you. So one is the impact on seizure-related emergency department visits and intensive care unit admissions. So if you had surgery or if you had medicine, um, from that time point, what is the likelihood of that happening and does that help? Okay. And then the, the next one is actually impact um, on um, communication, behavior, and quality of life. So how do we measure all that together? So when we're looking at this, looking at a national data set for, um, for electronic medical records and data that's already there with treatments that you've received, and when we look at that, we actually said, wait, hold on. How do we know we're actually studying LGS, right? Could it be LGS-like? Could it be DEEs? And then the other thing is when we look at the impact on expressive communication, behavior, and quality of life, outcomes that matter to you, then we say, okay, we really want to study that. But wait a minute. How do we actually measure that in a way that is helpful to you? So how many of you in the room have received surveys and, and you're looking at this saying, this doesn't apply. Like, how do I even answer this? Many hands, right? So those are the, the things that, that we are trying to answer together because the study is as, only as good as the, we can make it. So there are multiple sites in the study. Uh, we call them high intensity sites or low or, or kind of light touch sites. So there, there are seven high intensity sites, which means there's chart reviews, there's the opportunity to interact uh, with patients and offer the, um, the opportunity to do these behavior communication and quality of life surveys. And then the light touch sites were actually um, aggregating um, 
uh, real world data from the medical records to be able to have large numbers so that we can have um, uh, power to be able to answer these questions meaningfully. So this is why, right? And then you see the challenges on how and why we need input to make it good. So the learning so far, um, I'll, I'll just touch on, on two. So the diagnosis of LGS, right? We wanted to just find everybody with LGS in these records and actually say surgery or meds, right? Um, but when you look at ICD-10 codes and, and what, um, what your doctors actually have to select in the medical record, there's just all these codes, right? So even though it would be very straightforward to say LGS, G40.81, um, is it obvious or is it not? So we actually tried to see this, like, could we identify like a fingerprint uh, of LGS? So, and so we actually looked um, in a de-identified way at, at, um, at, at a series of charts to actually see, can we find all these three elements and does that correspond uh, with G40.81? So we're learning from um, 934 cases accumulated from the seven high touch centers. And we're trying to see if we can find information that is already in the medical records that help us identify LGS with confidence. So we know that we're studying what we say we're studying so that you can have trust in what we're, what we're able to study and that the results coming up. So it's, we're looking for things that you can find from the medical records. So you don't have to talk to your doctor or go through the EEGs or go through the medical records. It, it's actually, we're trying to see, we've done all that in these 900 something cases. So we're actually trying to see if there are things that pop up in the codes or, or the medicines that will help us come up with the best combinations to, to show you this fingerprint that, that is LGS. And this is relevant not only for this study, it's actually for future studies. When we look at other opportunities, right? If it's clinical trials, if it's other questions that are very practical questions um, that, that matter to you, we need to know, are we studying LGS? So it's gonna power future studies altogether. So when we looked at these cases, these 900 something cases, we actually did this um, essentially by hand. We went through um, the medical records and, um, and used a, a, a secure portal with de-identified data, and then actually looked um, when we can find these elements that, that help us, these three things that help us um, come up with the diagnosis of LGS. When we put that together and we review it and we have epileptologists that look at that, they'll say, yes, this is LGS, or no, this is not LGS. And then if we need a tiebreaker, if the two epileptologists don't agree, then our um, main epileptologist, Dr. Anu Patel, will look at it and be the tiebreaker. And there should just be consensus, right? Um, and that would be the end. Um, and it turns out that it's actually kind of hard. When you ask multiple epileptologists, they don't always all agree. So we spent a lot of time actually saying, okay, well, why don't we agree? Um, and how do we make sense of this? So as we're looking, you know, when we first designed the study, we thought we'd use this one code. And then this is the evolution of, of the level of sophisticated work that um, Dr. Mark Rosenman is doing. And when you look at all these codes and then the different codes and the different medications and you put them together, how all of this will overlap and where we'll come up with this fingerprint or this computable phenotype of what LGS is. And that will help us with future studies. So, um, so this brings up actually what um, Elaine Worrell talked about yesterday is, um, and also what we've talked about this morning uh, with DEEs, is that, well, are there peaches? Is this a peach-like fruit? Um, so, you know, what are we looking at in the medical records? Is it LGS? Is it not yet LGS? Is it Lennox gastoid or Lennox gasto like, or is it a DEE? So um, you'll you'll see this code again, um, and you'll find it at our table as well. Is we need to hear from you. Actually, we need a quick reality check. Um, these are just a few questions. It will take you um, less than two minutes. To actually, help us say, are we on the right track? Are we asking the right things and looking at the right things in the records so that when we say, aha. This is the answer for surgery or meds for LGS, that we make sure that we were studying what you think we're studying. So this is kind of the midpoint of our study where we, where we need a reality check. 
So um, you can use this code now. You'll, it'll come up later, or you can just find it at our table. So the second learning so far um, are behavior, communication, and quality of life, which are your lived experience, right? This is what matters to you every single day. So it's not ultimately surgery or meds and do we end up in the ER. It's actually what is our, what, what is our quality of life for my loved one and for our entire family. So two years ago um, here, uh, you were able to actually help us start looking at this question is um, how do we measure behavior, communication, and quality of life together? So when you have healthcare encounters um, in clinic, um, we asked, is this important to you? Behavior, communication, quality of life. And then we asked, is this actually being talked about or measured by, by your healthcare professional um, who's, who's caring for you? So the purple is actually, is this important to you? And you can see that those are pretty tall things, right? That's important. Um, and that's what, that's what you're saying is important. And then look at the green. Is, is you're telling us, is this effectively communicated by your healthcare professional? That we're actually looking at behavior, communication, and quality of life. Look at how short those green things are. So there's a mismatch, right? To like, we're not doing as good as we could be doing for you, for outcomes that matter to you. So when we looked at, well, why isn't this happening? And there are multiple things um, that, that came out uh, with the survey together is, we don't really have good surveys. Um, do we not have time? Um, we don't have information. What's going on? Um, is this relevant? So actually, you all helped us uh, with focus groups to say, um, OK, let's do this. So how do we find? surveys together that actually mean something to you and that that's actually reflecting your lived experience. So, um, so that was um, the, uh, the process that we came to select the surveys together. Um, so uh, this is the part that AIM-1B, um, if you come to our table, you'll see if you're one of uh, at the seven sites, you'll be able to see if you can um, participate and actually tell us about communication, behavior, and quality of life, and if you've had surgery or meds and how that has changed over time. So we can't do this without you. This is for you, and this is, this is critically important. So that's actually how we're trying to answer these questions. Um, it's based on, on you know, 900 validated medical records, but then actually thousands of medical records across the country. But we need to make sure this, this matters to you. And then just coming down the pipeline, something new and exciting that PCORI agreed to sponsor with all of us is actually what is the burden of, of caring for a loved one with, with LGS? And how do we measure those costs? And we know from a survey done uh, together um, that, uh, that the family impact uh, of living with a child with a DE or LGS is, is substantial, right? That you're living on a roller coaster, that you don't get enough sleep, you have severe fatigue. So, and also that over half of you experience financial challenges. And when you look across the US census data, um, uh, People living with epilepsy uh, in, in their household report one in four adults in these households giving up their job or reducing their work hours to take care of a child with epilepsy. And if you look at a, a Dravet syndrome report, um, each family every year living with a child with Dravet syndrome reports 47 days of missed work. So this is what we're going to study next after we finish the data analysis and the surgery or meds for LGS. And this is something that's critically important to study and to highlight before we can do better and redesign how we actually have this lived experience and do something about it together. So um, this is the timeline that's coming up in 2025. And that's why we need your voice. I'll just list the ways you can participate right now at this meeting. So focus group um, happening tomorrow morning uh, for how do we share these results beyond everybody in this room? How do we get that to the community? And how do we uh, make that even better? And how do you, I need you to help make us better and more effective in this. And then how do we prioritize what we're gonna study next uh, beyond the, the next steps? And then also help give us a reality check to make sure we're actually studying what 
what we say we're studying so that we can make this good for you. And then this will actually help us work all together so that we can power future studies all together and uh, work towards what Tracy is building is that this is for everybody, that you own this and that um, we're doing this not to you, but with you because of you and so that we can do better for you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sandy. That's such great and rich information. And um, it really does represent a sort of a change in the way things are being done. I hope you guys um, feel really proud of everything that you've contributed to this already uh, for so many of you and the ways that we get to weigh in again and again. So um, this is going to be a really exciting study. And I, after I announced the focus group um, uh, yesterday, I think we, we had another, uh, I don't know, 16 or 17 people sign up. So the, thank you, all of you, for raising your voice. 